The following program has been pre recorded, so please don't call in at this time. If you wish to participate in the program, tune in at 5 p.m. every Wednesday for A Pause for Thought on Baton Rouge Community Radio. <laughs> Good evening, fellow humans. This is Wayne Parker with a pause for thought here on Baton Rouge Community Radio, 96.9 FM here in Baton Rouge. Well, welcome to the show, everyone. Lang Baker's with us again tonight. Good evening, Lang. Howdy, Wayne. And I'd like to remind everybody, this is a live call-in show. Feel free and encouraged to call in and share your thoughts or questions and comments on the topic of the evening. And tonight's topic was kind of fun for me, Lang, and, well, they're all fun for me, really, but I enjoy uh, enjoy this one in particular because um, there's a lot of neat things involving some of the ancient games of humanity, and um, we were talking about some of them. The, the categories I chose for this evening, to at least to start us off, are uh, first is game ball games, games that involve balls, uh, games with animals, then, and then games that use sticks, but we also have some interesting games... Um, they don't involve any of those. No, no. But they're, but they're just, oh, they're just playing good fun, you know. But anyway, um, I thought since, Lang, you came up with a greater variety of the Mesoamerican type ball games, that I would start out with just the general one that I've, that I looked into. Um, the one that I, I saw was just called Mesoamerican Ball Game. And I recall seeing the pictures in like in sixth grade when we studied the Mayans and the, the Central American cultures, um, seeing the pictures of the stone walls with these vertical stone hoops mounted high upon them. And uh, I recall speculating that it was some kind of like basketball thing or whatever, and it turns out that's true. Um, they began according to... Um, ancient history encyclopedia around 2500 BCE, uh, which was a long time ago. Yeah, I think the Mesoamerican ball games were about the oldest we came across in any of the categories. Yeah, well, that, that's that's pretty cool, though. It, and it's on our continent, too, so we can sort of kind of be proud of it, right? Yeah. Um, but the, basically, they had a, a, a wide field that had uh, stone walls along its length on each side. Um, and I have here that they were about 480 feet long and um, about 118 feet high, I think. That's, that's awfully high, though. And I've got width, but I don't, I don't see that there. But, um, but they could be slanted outward as well as completely vertical. And, of course, the stone um, discs or, or hoops were mounted up on it um, eight feet or higher. Uh, one account I read said that uh, the hoops... Uh, were eight meters off the ground, but I, like I said before the show, that sounds awfully high, 24 feet. Um, but anyway, they they played with a latex or a rubber ball, which really surprised me. I didn't know that people had the ability to uh, process latex back then, but again, I think I recall reading, you know, for this show um, that Central America is one of the big uh, latex places, you know, where, where that stuff grows. Are you familiar with that? Uh, I don't know. I know that that uh, before synthetic rubber, there was they would gather the sap from the trees in on this hemisphere. I, I've heard about them in Brazil. I don't know if that was commercial production later, but yeah, the rubber was was from from the sap of some species of tree. Okay. Um, but yeah, here the the balls would be anywhere from four to twelve inches in diameter and weigh from uh, one to eight pounds. And they weren't allowed to touch the ball with their hands. Um, and of course, since um, since getting it th the ball through the hoop using um, your thighs, forearms, um, heads, I guess, or any other part of your body besides your hands, um, since that was so difficult, they, they could also score points by getting it across a goal or pass a certain point um, on the opponent's, on opponent's side. But um, it was also a, a bit of a religious thing, too, I think, or that was associated with it. They found depictions near the uh, old stadiums where, um, that showed the skulls of the players. And apparently if um, the winning team got trophies and all kinds of praise and the losers 
um, at least their captain would be killed and beheaded. And uh, sometimes they did the whole team. So, um, but yeah, they, they also were allowed to wear um, padding and belts for their knees, hips, elbows, wrists, as well as some helmets, according to some of the depictions they found. Yeah, some of what I came across uh, about the Mayan version of the, gra- of the game, which dates back more than 3,000 years. Uh, the game was an enactment of a conflict between the forces of darkness and light. And by tradition, t- two twin brothers used their time on Earth to play ball. And through the noise of the game, the anger of the master of the underworld was aroused. And after the game, uh, one of the brothers was decapitated and his head was used as the game ball. So that myth of Mm -hmm. uh, that was in the background or the basis for the development of the game would would, uh, coincide with what you were describing. Yeah, I mean, the brother's head was chopped off, hence uh, a ritual is born. the, The decapitated trunk trunk of the of the loser his blood escaped in the form of snakes and the blood was regarded as a symbol of fertility so you can see there's that fertility or religious or mythological component to this game as well and so uh, it, the game was to show their devotion to the gods well, uh, yeah that, that baffles me but uh, are there any other variations on the, the rubber ball or well, there the goals are, yeah, I, I guess the, this uh, Mesoamerican ball game spread through various cultures. There was a, a version of it called Ulama, which was the Aztec version, and is still played in uh, communities in the Mexican state of Sinaloa. Uh, and it, that's referred to, in this source, as the oldest known game using a rubber ball. And uh, it's play, it's it's. It's found in nearly all of the cultures from uh, modern-day Mexico to El Salvador and even perhaps in modern-day Arizona and New Mexico, according to what archaeologists have uh, uncovered, uh, including uh, rubber balls back to at least 1600 B.C., you know, 2600 years ago. They found rubber balls from those games. And uh, the modern-day version of that game, the Aztec version, uh, there are three forms of that that are still played. Uh, there's one version where they use the hip for hitting the ball, which uses a, a ball that's about seven pounds. And then there's a version where they use the forearm, which women often play that game. And that reminds me of volleyball and the way forearms are used in volleyball, but I, or I don't know that much about whether there's any connection between volleyball and in those games or not. I don't know the origins of volleyball. Hmm. But then there's also a version that's played with a one-pound ball uh, where they use paddles to hit the ball with instead of parts of their body. Yeah, I read where there were variations in um, the Mesoamerican game, and maybe this was just a generic, generic topic or, uh, you know, covering all of them, where some of them used sticks to get it through. But the, the one rule, of course, um, when they weren't using sticks is you couldn't touch it with your hands. You could use your forearm or hip or knee or thigh, you know. Well, in, it says that from what I read that the first team to score eight points wins the game. However, it's since the teams take turns, if it ends up a tie, then they both go back to zero. And so the game can go on and on. Bummer. If, if they tie a lot of them and says there's one record setting game that lasted for eight days. I don't know. Did what, they stop to sleep or eat or I didn't hear I didn't see any uh commentary on on that. You know, that's a common theme I've found through these ancient sports is they must have been really tough people. You know, I mean, just imagine how strong you'd have to be in the stamina to to play a game with a 12-pound rubber ball, you know? Yeah. Yeah, w- one thing that uh comes out in a lot of these what? different games is the use of it for military training. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. Uh, so you would think that the strength required would be Im- important for that that purpose of it. Sure. But but, and then the religious themes common in a lot of these games as well. Right. And the third Mesoamerican game that I came across was one that's called Peloto Purecha, Purecha, which is uh, similar to hockey, it says. And that's one that's played with a game with a ball that's lit on fire and played at night. And it oh, says it originated okay. as a representation of of uh, a legend of a battle between day and night, with the flaming ball signifying the sun. Well, and you would and mention the, play, the players representing the movement of the universe. So there's yeah. a, 
a symbolic religious component to that, that game as well. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I mean, that, that makes sense. I'm, I'm, re- I'm thinking now of that, I don't know if you ever watch ice hockey, but they've got to where they, they have a green uh, blurry thing that moves with the puck so you can always see where the puck is you know and I'm, I'm kind of thinking that computer they got that idea <laughs> from the, those from, the, from that game yeah. I mean. yeah but there are a lot of other cultures that have ball based games as well there are a couple of Irish ones that date back uh, pretty far as well uh, one of those one of those games is called hurling oh uh, wait a minute an Irish game called hurling right. it's, a, it's a drinking game right <laughs> Not the not this particular one. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> but it's it's ref- it's described as a m- kind of a mixture of of hockey and lacrosse, and uh, goes back some three thousand years, and was pretty violent. The participants were often left bruised and bloodied, and the teams could have hundreds of players on a team. <laughs> uh, and they say it was brought to to Ireland by the the Celts. Uh, and based on tales of mythological heroes dating back as far as the 12th century B.C. Uh, it was, it they, was an they, outdoor game played with a, a small ball. And I think they had like uh, they had sticks that were anywhere from 18 inches to 33 inches long, I think, or something like that. And that could be I didn't come across that part Okay, they it. were heavy. Let me see if I can find my notes here for hurling. Um, but as I recall, they were... I looked, I saw a picture of them. They were... Um, Rather heavy, club-like things. Um, yeah, 18 to 30 inches long uh, paddle or paddle-like end is what I'd written down here. And the ball was um, usually a cork center covered with two pieces of leather, very similar to a baseball, is what I read. So, um, but they could they would bat it around. Um, it says here that they could reach uh, speeds of 90 miles an hour. But uh, just a cork ball covered with leather, the leather doesn't seem that heavy, though, or dangerous. But I guess anything hitting you at 90 mile an hour is going to hurt or at least expect, sting. Yeah. But uh, they, could, they could bat it back and forth in the air, or a guy could pick it up and toss it up in front of him and hit it himself and, and try to get it into the goal, I guess. Yeah, well, if it's compared to lacrosse, I guess they've got some throwing arm they can heal it, heat it with as well, give it faster speed, ex- just like an adult adult works to right, yeah, yeah. How about that? You're the so. This yeah. could involve hundreds of players and could last for days. Another one, okay, yeah. And <laughs> I did, so I do see here in my notes that it's one of those games that has a, a three thousand year old history. Mm-hmm. So it's been around a while. Well, the Celts, yeah, that was probably yeah. a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. And the other Irish game involving what you might say as a ball was the game called Apple Feet, which was primarily a part of military training. Apple Feet. F E A T. Okay. Yeah, and uh, it was it was used in military training, but it's also treated as a competitive sport. And uh, in the practice sessions, the Irish used apples to avoid injuring onlookers or <laughs> spectators. That's respectful. But uh, when they got serious, they would use stones instead of apples. And uh, it was used during religious and ritual ceremonies and. Uh, when after steel, after iron was introduced in the eighth or ninth century B.C., they started using iron balls. Good heavens! And during their religious and ritual ceremonies, some of the tribes uh, threw specially prepared brains of their foes to demonstrate the supremacy of one tribe over another. That the brain was extracted from a smashed skull and hardened with a special lime mixture. Yeah. Well. It takes brains to play that sport, I guess, or at least it took brains. Um, how did was it was it a way to demonstrate your tribe superiority over another one's? I mean, I'm that's, wondering. That's what this source says. Is that's why they used brains? Was like they okay, took so the brains of their enemies when they smashed them in battle, I guess, and then okay, but they and then hardened them in oh, so they could use them as a weapon later <laughs> against their. But okay, yeah, because their their battle their their rivals in battle wouldn't be watching this game, so they wouldn't be like they were taunting them or anything, but. Um, well, I don't know whether they, or maybe they, they took them back the to the same tribe afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> well, for the next the next battle. Well, yeah. Did, they, did, we, did you talk about if they what do they do with the ball though? They they bat it around and, or throw it or? Yeah, it was, it was used for throwing. Okay, that has me wondering about they, the apples. They said they they would carry they'd have a like a pouch on the back of their shield that they carry these balls in and they pull them out and throw them in battle. 
Oh, okay. Okay, so you, you struck the other guy with them, okay, and... Yeah, yeah, I guess it, before they had cannons. They <laughs> yeah, before they had, <laughs> had to use their arms. Or, and atlatl too, I guess, because they yeah. they're they're a neat instrument too. But we'll, yeah. we don't want to get onto that. But yeah. So and then there also there was a, a Chinese ball game uh, that was used as an exercise for the military in the third or to second century BC. That game's called Kuju. Uh, it says it was is similar to. Uh, Soccer, although there's no uh, connection to soccer in the, in the evolution of the game. Well, all these are are similar, I guess. To yeah, they all involve the same thing. Um, one way or another, getting an object from one end of the field to another, or getting into a goal or whatever, yeah. or hitting somebody but, with it. You know, yeah. Like, like. So this this game was used both as a competitive competitive form and for as fitness training for the military. Uh, it was a feather, a feather stuffed ball originally, and later they filled it with air, in a hmm. two layer. So that's that's pretty interesting that they'd have an air filled ball back that long back ago. Then, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me let me make a quick uh, announcement here. This is Wayne Parker with Lang Baker coming to you from Baton Rouge Community Radio. Feel free to call in. We're discussing ancient games. Three four three nine nine two seven. Three four three nine nine two seven. Share a game that you know of that you find interesting. Um, and I'd like to move on to our second category, if I could, okay. which was um, games with animals. And I've been wanting to talk about this one ever since I first learned about it in the late 90s. The national sport of Afghanistan, it is Baskashi is what it is called. And Baskashi, according to my notes, literally translated means goat grabbing. And the way I read it years ago in an article um, back in the 90s was they, they would use a, a small calf that was soaked in a mountain stream for like 24 hours to make it good and slimy. And the, the object was played, the, object, the, the game was played on horseback between two teams of riders. And um, the carcass that they were fighting over would be placed inside a, um, a, a circle made by lime. And the, the, the object would be to get in there and get control of the carcass and ride to a certain place and deposit it in a goal, so to speak. And um, it doesn't sound that hard, except you're fighting with a whole bunch of other guys, and they have whips. And, of course, the rules specify that the whips can only be used on the rival team's horses, but we can imagine that accidents frequently happen and things like that. And um, I also recall from the, the earlier article I read many years ago that um, there would be clowns, kind of like in today's uh, rodeos and things like that. Clowns would run out in the middle of the, the fray, I mean, amongst all these horsemen fighting over this carcass. Uh, but these, these clowns would come out and throw the dead bodies of smaller animals into the goal, you know, and just make a big scene and all that. I guess, I guess it was all just a, a really fun game. But um, the notes that I got for tonight uh, states here that to many Afghans, Biskazi is not just a game, it is a way of life. And it's a way to accentuate or develop teamwork and communication, uh, which are essential to a healthy culture. And I was thinking to myself, well, why don't they just play bridge, you know? <laughs> but, uh, I mean, you got to communicate with your partner, you know, and, you know, all that, well, whatever. But, um, you know, I, I remember, too, back in the 90s, I read about Biskashi when, um, right about the time Bill Clinton was scolding the Afghans for their poor treatment of women. And I thought, yeah, are they going to listen to you, buddy, you know? <laughs> sitting there in your comfortable office, you know, scolding them about how they treat their women. And these guys fight over a, you know, a carcass, a calf. But uh, anyway, what do you got on animals? Well, I ran across a couple of them that I guess could fall in that category, although I'm not sure you'd call this first one a game. It was uh, a Roman event called Venatio, uh, which was uh, people versus wild animals. And it was used more as a form of, well, entertainment slash uh, execution proceedings, where after after the trial, when uh, the convicted Roman citi convicted ro Roman citizens of lower class were uh, convicted in order to be executed, they 
would uh, put them out in the ring with a bunch of wild animals that had been gathered from the far reaches of the Roman Empire. And uh, with the people who, had, who were condemned didn't have any kind of weapons to defend themselves. It was just fight, fight the beasts. Yeah, I, I've got where they, um, they did sometimes give the guys weapons, and sometimes it was the animals just fighting amongst themselves, much like cockfighting and dogfighting and other barbaric sports that still exist today. But um, did, did you, say, did you well, see anything about animals that they used? Well, um, like I say, they, they gathered wild animals from all over the empire, including you know lions and, and bears and... Tigers. But, oh, my. But not wolves, because the wolves had a special place in the religion of the Romans. The Rome was founded by Romulus and Remus, who were suckled by a, a she-wolf. Oh, okay. And so that has, that has special religious significance for them. So, so the Romans generally refrain from intentionally harming wolves. Yeah, you don't make fun. You don't make sport of your uh, gods, I guess, right? Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I've got here where they, um, they included elephants, lions, leopards, bears, bulls, and tigers. Um and that's in my t- list of top uh, top ten list of things or, or the worst way to die is being killed by a wild animal. But um, yeah, well, it says that when the when the Colosseum in Rome was was inaugurated, that first event there was uh, included the killing of over nine thousand beasts in one of these. Wow, spectacles. you know, yeah, and I, I remember reading um, that with the gladiators, uh, there were like. 3,000 people killed in one day um, during one of the gladiator matches, but uh, that's kind of, you know, we, we couldn't cover all the games in here, so, um, but yeah, since I mentioned the gladiators, though, and you mentioned the Colosseum, I'm going to segue into um, my Namatia. Namatia, which was an ancient game the Romans also played, but they would build an arena or use one that already existed and fill it with water um, deep enough to float um, a modern warship from back in those days and according to what I, I found out about this it was, it was extremely expensive because everything it was all done to um, reenact actual conflicts and later on it developed into just a plain entertaining event and of course they used um, convicts it condemned men to fight it but they would dress them up the boats had to be built to size and um, with all the detail and everything else, and had to maneuver the same way that the real boats did. And the men would actually battle in this in five feet of water, which was necessary to float those boats, and kill each other. You know, and of course, all the gore and blood, and you know, they'd be out there slipping on it and falling down, and, and the, the people would be cheering and eating their popcorn and all. It's just, just fascinating. But uh, but they actually filled whole arenas with water for these for these you know navy games. Yeah, they're in fact. There's this other other uh, sport, if you want to call it that, called fisherman jousting in ancient Egypt, uh, which was served kind of as the basis for Nemausia's naval reenactments later. Uh, and these, these were sometimes, I mean, it's speculative a lot as to just what the purpose of them, of these, oh, sure, these yeah. events were, but they, some... Uh, scholars believe that there was a religious aspect to this and that these competing boats were filled with offerings to honor the gods and combat would occur between the boats when uh, there was a close race between them to deliver their offerings to the gods. But what what the battle was on the competing boats, these people would fight to knock the player or the, the people in the other boat out into the water and then They'd get eaten. To tie it in with the animals yes. here, this wasn't like they brought in exotic animals. These were the animals in the Nile, the crocodiles and the hippos, and so, and yeah. also a lot of the people didn't know how to swim, so they might just drown if there wasn't an animal handy to finish them off faster. Uh, but then this this was ar- around 2700 BC, so that goes back. Yeah, a long ways. Probably, yeah, probably about the time that these these. Uh, sacrificial ball games in Mesoamerica were taking place. Interesting. Um, games with animals, I did want to get back or to that since I got us off the subject anyway, but uh, looking up Baskashi, where they use a, a carcass of a goat or a small calf, uh, there I also discovered the game of, or the sport of Pato, 
which is now the um, the national sport of Argentina and has been since 1953. But um, there were accounts from as early as 1610 of this game being played. And pato is duck in Spanish, and the the full name is Juego del Pato. Game of game of duck. duck game, yeah, or a game of duck, right? Yeah, duck game. Yeah, and uh, how they played it, it was. It was basically a, a, it was on a horseback. Two teams would fight over a basket that contained a live duck. And the basket had handles on it. And, of course, they would tussle over this basket with the duck in it. And presumably at some point, after lots of quacking and whatever kind of other kinds of noises of terror, you know, the duck would die. But the uh, object back then was to um, get the duck back to your ranch house. It was usually played in a very broad area um, because it was basically a, a, a play war game between two rival uh, ranches or whatever. But um, it was eventually modified at the, at the insistence of the Catholic priests that came there from Spain um, to stop using the duck. And uh, also they, they, they modified it a, a good bit more um, because there were a lot of deaths involved with it because guys could get angry and get into knife fights and kill each other. But um, basically the game was if you, you, when you got a hold of one of the handles of the basket, and now they use a ball, but when you got a hold of one of the handles of the object, you had to hold it out at arm's length so that a rival player could ride up and grab one of the other handles, and then you would tussle over it on horseback. And according to what I read here, they say that, that was the most exciting part of the uh, the struggle, and I would think so, because you could pull a guy off his horse, you know, or that, that takes a lot of strength to hold yourself on a horse, moving, and, and fight over this silly thing. But uh, they got to where they, they throw it into an eight-foot-high uh, vertical net. It looks a lot like the um, nets they use in basketball, only it's, it's vertical. But anyway, it's, I just imagine you're looking, using a duck for a f- sport like that was just um, interesting. Anyway. What else we got here? We got, um, look at my list. Oh, games that use sticks. I know we already covered a couple of those anyway. Hurling was one, right? Yeah, and in these uh, fishermen jousting were using sticks right. uh, against each other as well. But then there's the Nguni stick fighting of the Zulus in southern Africa, which uh, was a martial art tradition practiced by herders and uh, apparently this kind of, of game is uh, developed in societies and cultures that used herding as a part of their systems of survival which is rather interesting you know a lot of the games we talked about before are, are more warrior societies and so their games were along the lines of combat and here we've got a culture that's hurting, and so their their uh, game it's a martial art, but it uses the kinds of skills that herders would use to protect their herds. But they whack each other with the sticks, don't they? Yeah, they're armed with two long sticks. One is for offense, and one is for defense, and oh, sometimes okay. a shield as well. Uh, in modern times, it usually occurs as part of a wedding ceremony where the warriors from the bridegroom's household and area uh, meet with the bride's household and so they have these, this kind of game among between the two families. Okay, uh, but it's basically so it's, just... It's more peaceful, yeah, these are, it is a martial art kind right, of game. Right, and, and these are flexible sticks like saplings or whatever, little branches that they whack each other with or whip each other, huh? That, that was my understanding, yeah. Yeah, the one I read, it, it showed... Um, a guy that had scars literally all over him, and they said that the scars were badges of honor, you know. Mm-hmm. But, you know, this reminded me that the guys making a sport out of basically just whacking each other or hurting each other, inflicting non-lethal pain, reminded me of um, the ear, nose, and nipple fights that my friends and I used to play when we were in high school. You know, during the summer, you know, guys would be out, you know, with no shirts on or whatever, and we'd, we'd wrestle on the ground or end up wrestling on the ground. Uh, and the object was just to get a hold of an ear or their nose or their lip or a nipple and twist it as hard as you could to inflict pain. And we'd be laughing like crazy and howling in pain at the same time. It was it was quite fun for adolescent guys, you know. Yeah. But um, well, I th- there, 
it's, it's interesting how the, the games reflect different cultures. Uh, to take it to the opposite extreme of these combative games we've been looking at, that there are a couple of Australian Aboriginal games that are both ball games, and one of them is very much like hockey sock is, where it's a cooperative game where four to eight participants would be in a circle, and it was to see how long the group together could keep the ball in the air by, you know, manipulating with their feet. Well, a culture that stresses cooperation, huh? No wonder yeah. they got beaten by the British, right? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, and then there there was another Australian Aboriginal ball game, which uh, where they would kick and catch the ball, but it also was a cooperative game. It was played at gatherings and celebrations with up to 50 players. But uh, from observers... The Europeans who came up said the game appeared to lack any team objective, no real rules, no scoring, no winner. It was just to go out there and have fun. Yeah, and it sounds like it would be a lot of ball fun. And being yeah. cooperative about it. Sounds like it would be a lot of fun. Well, Lang, we're out of time. Uh, we didn't get we didn't get to shin kicking, which is what I wanted to talk we about. Didn't cover the Greek game. No, well, maybe we'll get to them uh, some other time. Anyway, you've been listening to Wayne Parker and Lang Baker on a pause for thought here on Baton Rouge Community Radio. We gotta go. We thank you for listening. Have a good night.